So here we go with respiratory system, gas exchange, right? Oxygen in, carbon dioxide out for most kind of things like us. So to get it started, Joey, Joey, look at that. Your face is right in that dog's butt, Joey. Man's best friend, isn't he? So anyway, here we go. I decided to keep all the red stuff in this one slide and all the green stuff in the next slide just so you'd have it there and all in one place. But just as a reminder, the red stuff is for everybody to know. The purple stuff, which there isn't any of in this in this set of notes because none of that made the higher level stuff. Um, and then you're going to see green stuff on the next slide. There it is. The green stuff is the optional stuff, which we would have been doing, except they canceled that in 2020, 2021. So we're, I'm going to blow through it really fast today. But I thought I'd start to leave these uh, on these notes all in one place where like right before the test, you could just go down the list here and make sure you know everything you need to know. So here we go. Um, this uh, I like these kind of diagrams that show a, a whole lot of things like all at once. Um, they uh, show big kind of system things. They have organism level represented by this box which is kind of like a cell but this would be the whole organism and then this would be each and every cell in that organism's basic ideas right and here it is the oxygen in carbon dioxide out why do we have to get the oxygen in right because it's needed where exactly right at the very end of electron transport change remember to keep them going in that kind of respiration we call aerobic because they're so good at grabbing electrons. They grab electrons from the end of the chain. They also grab protons, and that's when they become, again, water. So just reviewing that part here, this is what has driven the whole need, so to speak, the whole selection pressure of having a respiratory system. So what that means is, oh, sorry, let's go back to why we gotta get rid of carbon dioxide. A big reason is because when it dissolves in water, it becomes a weak acid. We're going to come back to that. And that pH drop, that starts to affect body chemistry. So hence the need to get rid of the carbon dioxide is almost as strong as the need to get rid of, uh, to get oxygen in. So here you have a schematic again of, a, of an organism like you and I. Somewhere outside is that source of oxygen. This is sometimes referred to as the respiratory medium. If you're a fish, it's the water that you're swimming in where the oxygen is dissolved. If you're you and I, it's the air outside, but somehow the oxygen in that air outside has to bump into the outside of your body. Well, when it bumps into most of what we think of as the outside of your body, your skin, it can't get through because it's dead layer of cells and all through way too thick. So it's got to bump into a surface that is thin and also wet so that it can dissolve and then diffuse through that thin layer. Where is that? In things like you and I, it's deep in your lungs in those parts called alveoli. Where is this respiratory surface if you're a fish? It's the surface of your gills, which is directly bumping into the water that you're swimming in. All of those respiratory surfaces, no matter what the animal, no matter what the whatever, no matter what the, it doesn't have to be an animal, right? A, a, a bacteria cell has to get carbon dioxide out and oxygen in. What's its respiratory surface? Well, it's just its cell membrane, right? So all organisms have a respiratory surface of some sort, thin and wet is what they all have to be to be efficient, okay? So then that oxygen has to diffuse into each cell through its plasma membrane, right? Which it also had to diffuse through cells here at the respiratory surface. And now we remember a little bit of diffusion, osmosis, transport kind of stuff. What kind of molecule is oxygen? It's nonpolar, right? A couple of oxygens double bond. They have obviously the same electronegativities. And so neither has a uh, there's not an unequal sharing of electrons, neither has a greater affinity, electronegativity than the other. So this nonpolar, fairly small thing can diffuse right through the bilayer. Doesn't need the help of a protein. We keep reviewing as we go. Okay, 
So um, this is what I said each day. What was the great selection pressure, not the, but one of, one of the big selection pressure advantages for life, which started in the water and for a long time could only be in there to crawl out onto land and become that kind of life we call terrestrial. One of them is this, the concentration of oxygen in that respiratory medium that we call the atmosphere is much greater than it is in the water. So, this, I will throw this in here. You might remember this from chemistry. Unlike solid substances, which when you heat up water, you can dissolve more of it in, like salt and sugar, more dissolve in hot water, gases work the opposite way. As water temperature gets higher, gases can't dissolve in it as well, so they come out of that solution and so when your fish tank heats up too much, your fish suffocate because the water doesn't have as much oxygen as when it's cooler. That's why the waters of the world that have the most fish are the cooler waters, not the equatorial ones. So anyway, um, so carbon dioxide, also nonpolar like oxygen, cross the respiratory surface entirely by simple diffusion, not facilitated and not active transport, right? That diffusion, as we've already talked about, is very slow. And that's why thin and wet is what they all have to be. And then if this oxygen is coming across a surface in the carbon dioxide out, right? And you can squiggle that surface up so that in the same amount of space, you have lots of surface instead of this much. Right. We see that that very common kind of thing about surface area increased is a structural thing, which makes the efficiency of a functional thing. Gases crossing that barrier um, much more efficient. So um, uh, here we have just a tiny bit. I'll go into the animal kingdom because, again, you have to just a tiny bit. Um, about different respiratory systems that have evolved into this kind of thing compared to that uh, because they might be one of those uh, general characteristics that they ask you to distinguish between this kind of animal and that kind of animal. So um, we have some things like insects. Insects are a great example of how evolution can work in some things in a fairly completely different way than others. Insects have a set of tubes that they suck air into. Those tubes have openings all down the back of its body. Those openings are called a spiracle. They're very much analogous to the um, stoma and the underside of a leaf. They're the opening which gases exchange, right? Very much so. Um, and then the tubes that that air is going into are kind of confusingly called the same thing that one big tube of ours is, the trachea, right? Um, and as that goes through and mixes in these air sacs also, these things branch so much, that's a little indication right there, so much more than is in this diagram, these things branch such that they basically touch each and every cell in that cockroach or grasshopper or whatever. Insects have these tracheal tubes that are analogous to, but totally evolved independently from the tubes of our respiratory system. So that's that. So that, that might be something you see in an insect compared to other kind of things, respiratory system. Um, so for um, many of the kind of animals that we uh, might have to distinguish between, we have gills or we have lungs. And then if you're an insect, you have these tubes called tracheae, plural, okay? So uh, gills are actually outfoldings of the body surface. So if you take your body and like stretch it out, that's kind of like making a gill. And you can see it very clearly here on these kind of worms. That outer surface of the body has folded outward and folded to create a lot more surface area and their gills stick out, right? But since these are such critical kinds of organs, 
or gas exchange, very critical, right? It would make sense in an evolutionary kind of way if you could evolve to have them protected, still bump into a watery source of oxygen, but have them protected by something like a shell or in fish, uh, a covering, a flap over where the gills are underneath. That flap's called an operculum then that would make sense. And that is what evolution has fashioned in a lot of cases. But look at this, this gill sticking out here. So any kind of predator can come by and take a chomp out of it. Obviously it's still good enough to get them by because there it is. Their mere existence again is evidence of their evolutionary success. Doesn't have to be the best. It just has to work well enough for you to pass your genes on to the next generation. So, um, here is a, a characteristic of all of these systems also. If you have this respiratory system and it's bumping up against the source of oxygen, whether that's uh, air, uh, air or gas, um, and that air or gas just sits there, pretty soon the diffusion is going to cause that oxygen to be so low that not much more is going to diffuse. This is a gradient kind of thing. So if you keep it moving and bring in a fresh supply, constantly that would be a good thing and so systems have evolved to ventilate to move that fluid or air across the surface or maybe like a fish you just keep moving your whole body um, across that surface but one way or another to have the respiratory medium moving across the respiratory exchange membrane is a good idea and that's what has evolved